And I'm kind of curious how we change that public consensus, because what, what I heard from the panel was really go big or go home, right? We, we cannot change mass incarceration if we're not thinking, you know, kind of big and, and big and bold. Uh, but I re we live in a democracy. <laughs> and, you know, the consensus, at the very least, according to Michelle Alexander, is that many Americans are indifferent to some of the challenges that we are talking about. They, you know, they may hear the thing about cost. <laughs> um, and even in a neighborhood like Harlem, I have to say, some of the most conservative voices in my community, from pulpits to street corners, still talk the law and order and get tough on them. And why are you helping a criminal get a job when my kid needs a job? So on the ground, these are very, mm -hmm. it's very hard to combat that, that kind of mentality. So I'm wondering, what do we do to, to kind of change the public consensus uh, on, on mass incarceration, take this conversation out of nice, you know, academia and, and foundations to the streets? How do we do that? Um, my view, I think, is, uh, um, you know, in concert with uh, Dr. Alexander's, which is that, um, and my evidence is New York City, with our huge shift from, um, uh, lock them up uh, for drug sales to uh, modified or at least somewhat tending toward harm reduction uh, strategy. That came about after when the Rockefeller drug laws passed in 1993, the hue and cry began through 1983, 1993, 2003, building a mass, uh, what do you want to call it, public education movement. Uh, a mass protest against uh, stupid racist laws um, is absolutely elemental. So I'm uh, an outlier in this whole debate on this point. Um, I, uh, I think public policy, uh, public attitude follows public policy, not the reverse. Uh, I think we, you change policies, the people will follow, they'll figure out, hey, we have a new policy and everything's working fine, I guess it's fine. And um, uh, so I'm sympathetic to the argument that we need to change public opinion, but, um, uh, but I think public policy is the target and public opinion follows that. Uh, so, um, uh, so for example, it is not the case that loosening up attitudes about uh, marriage equality has led to more people being willing to go along with marriage equality. It is the reverse relationship, that when we changed laws about marriage equality, people's opinions started to change about it. I think the same thing's happening with marijuana. Uh, I think this will happen with reducing incarceration rates. I think it, a sort of laser focus on the things that, that, the, that drive incarceration rates will um, um, move an indifferent public to be accepting of that of the changes that focus produces i would i would add to to what todd's saying here that um when when i was a kid and this was black and white tv time for those of you who <laughs> have no concept What's of that. What's the television? Yeah. <laughs> you had to get up to go change channel. Um, we, had, we had TV shows like The Defenders, you know, and Humphrey Bogart was doing movies about the poor kids in, uh, in the ghetto and this, this young man. Yeah, I, was, I actually won an acting award for 12 Angry Men. I was the racist bigot. Um, <laughs> and that's what we had in the period where we were doing the, before we took off. Um, and I, I think um, one of the things that foundations, other folks could be doing a, a lot more on is just kind of that subtle under the radar kinds of, here's, I mean, it's not an accident that Law and Order and CSI, you know, Midwest City, Oklahoma, ended up um, paralleling and driving, I think, to some extent, um, a lot of the public belief. And, and I don't disagree with Todd. I mean, there's been good uh, public opinion polls always follow whatever the DAs or the, the policymakers or the newspapers are, are talking about. It, it's rare that the public gets out in front on 
these sorts of issues. But I also think that the media, I, I used to teach American government and there, in, in Western Oklahoma and there was just no overcoming John Wayne um, and <laughs> McClintock. Um, uh, people pick things up uh, from our culture in a variety of ways and uh, on, on gay marriage, how much of that was policymakers, how much of that was will and grace. Um, as, as you develop, uh, of course, it took Cheech and Chong, what, 40 years to get the pot <laughs> going, but look at them. Um, will and Grace, Cheech and Chong. I think there was a <laughs> PR problem there. Um, but um, what I'm saying, I, I think one of the things I always wanted our people to do at, at when I was working for the Department of Corrections in Oklahoma, we, had, we would have upper management meetings, the, the whole, you know, the whole crew of us, and we would have presentations. And one of the most effective was from a former inmate. And, and when we're talking about people who should be on these commissions and things that aren't, it would be nice to have people who've turned their lives around and actually, here's why I committed crimes and here's why I stopped, rather than having all these people saying, well, here's what it would take to stop me from committing a crime. And, and you know, well, good for you. Um, but he, he he got up in front of us. He had turned his life around. He was doing ministry, but he was also working with, with um, re-entering offenders. And, and he pointed at one of our probation and parole guys and said, that man saved my life. If it hadn't been for him, uh, I would probably still be in prison. And I, I tried, yeah, it's kind of like Todd's record of success, uh, to get our people to say, why isn't that showing at the front of, you know, you're getting all those commercials at the movies now uh, from car companies and, you know, somebody's, you know, um, dating site. Why not, um, why not have him and the guy's name was Dan Reynolds just sit and, and have him say, this is the guy. This guy changed my life. Because what you would have done in, in that, you would have been bringing, you would have been making it clear that corrections can make a difference in people's lives, and you would be showing people, here's a guy you don't have to be afraid of anymore because we work with him and because he saw what the opportunities were. Um, I, I think that message environment, uh, and I think it is shifting uh, to a great extent, uh, but I, I share the fear that Tanya has, has mentioned about, um, every, we've been through this before. Um, the 30s, we had a crime wave. The 60s into the 70s, we started this again. People don't remember, we kind of ebbed off of this at the end of the Carter administration and the beginning of Reagan. And then Len Bias died, another media thing, and it took off again. And um, I, I'm fearful that if we don't take advantage, not just of the policy opportunities, but of the opportunities to change people's perspectives, at least some, uh, even if they're not driving uh, the train yet, um, that we'll be back. As soon as the money's there, we've shown every time. As soon as the money comes back, we start building more prisons. It's just easier. Prisons are the easy way out. They're the least effective of most of the things we can do, and they're the easiest thing to do, and because most people don't feel like they're affected, they're indifferent to it, we just do it when we've got the dollars. Fortunately for us, it looks like climate change, peak oil, uh, water access shortages, and uh, infrastructure rotting and falling in on us might um, keep our economy really in doldrums for quite a long time, and therefore uh, keep this uh, situation going for longer than normal. Something to hope for. Um, <laughs> but I, I think we do need to uh, address that. and. Uh, in, in whatever ways the message, uh, message people could do that. Um, you know that the subject of how you affect pu public opinion on these issues has been, you know, a real intense, but I think underattended to debate in criminal justice reform. Um, you know, when you interview criminal justice practitioners, they'll tell you that we really have never gotten that quite right. Um, and I think there, there's, there's some who believe that you can affect a great deal of criminal justice reform under the radar, you know, without 
um, a big, noisy public education campaign. And I think, indeed, you can do some of that, particularly around the more administrative and technical reforms, you know, sort of getting rid of technical parole violations, altering, you know, probation and parole terms. Some of that is probably better done under the radar screen. But the harder stuff, I think, is sentencing reform, the front end, are we actually going to get rid of mandatory minimum sentences? That requires going to the legislature, and I think um, ultimately then requires engaging the public or at least, um, at least convincing legislators that they can stand up and defend those kinds of changes that benefit criminals, right, to their constituents. And that's where I think um, these issues of racial fear are so um, actually so trenchant. And um, where I think the debate is heavily, heavily class-based. Um, and I think we have to kind of think about that in a public education strategy. So, I mean, you know, I think it's definitely the case that even though I'm making this kind of broad racial justice argument that um, it's heavily class inflected, right? So, you know, people are not afraid of Oprah Winfrey, you know, not Barack Obama is not uniformly popular, but I don't think people are clutching their wallet when he walks into the East Room of the White House. Um, and then you look at somebody like Len Bias, who actually, you know, huge basketball star, and we actually had a lot of regressive policy made in his name because people were sympathetic to what they perceived as the death of this young promising star um, uh, because of crack cocaine. And so I think, um, like when I think about what is effective, um, you know, I, I think about the fact that one of the, f the few very public criminal justice reform campaigns that was effective, at least for a while, was around driving while black, you know, over almost 15 years ago, in the kind of pre-9-11 um, period. Um, and if you think about it, that issue, um, actually, and that, you know, that practice was politically vulnerable and, it became, and came under intense criticism, um, not because people in general had an issue with, with it, but because the practice was, was ensnaring a lot of middle class and upper class black folk, right, who were driving in their Lexuses or whatever. And you compare that, I think, with the longevity of stop and frisk and impact zone policing that affects mainly um, people in poor neighborhoods, poor minority neighborhoods. And I think you get a sense of, um, you know, the class dimension of this. And so I think we have to think about messengers. And I think it's one of the reasons why I'm suggesting that we really have to attend to the levels of unemployment um, in some of these heavily policed communities, which itself drives racial fear. So. Great, great. Um, so I want to open up the questioning, uh, the conversation in the back. And just stand, say your name, and ask your question. Maggie Smith, and I wondered um, if we could think for a minute following um, the discussion of macro, um, macroeconomic impacts that the structural changes in employment and family structure and women in the workforce have changed in the United States between 1970 and now. And we've responded from a governmental level with support for elderly people who need care. This has been a widespread recognition that if we don't provide social support for the elderly, they will not be able to make it or they will not thrive. So can we think about the impacts of these global family structure changes on young people, on particularly on adolescents, and begin to think about what it would mean to provide social support for them as well? Hmm. Todd. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, when I a different public uh, talk that I sometimes give, um, I m make the point that we now know that having a parent uh, go to prison uh, increases the chance of the child ending up in the justice system by 25%, uh, controlling for all the other factors. Uh, there's a whole other, there's a host of other negative outcomes of a parent going to prison, but that's one interesting one. And then from a pure standpoint of justice, you can argue that, you know, parents who commit crimes should go to prison. I mean, you're free to make that argument. But you can't argue that it is a matter of justice. Their children should suffer because the children didn't do anything. So the idea that we're going to have a, a heavy 
dose of in investment in, in prisons as a justice argument carries with it an equal and just as important justice argument that we want to make investments in the children who go there. Purely a justice argument, not, not a utilitarian one. Um, and then that opens up a debate about all of the other kinds of collateral consequences of having a large prison system. Um, so, and I get, uh, and when I talk about it in that way, I get, I get traction, I get people in the audience. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with, the th with thinking about a focus on youth, not because um, it's wrong, because I think, I think it's certainly right, but because um, uh, I think it, um, and I, without intending to, I think we create this idea that there are innocent youth and guilty adults. And I meant it when I said in this room that if everybody who were guilty of a crime had to go pay the cost, of that, that we'd all be gone. I really meant it. We've, all the studies we've done, I mean, the irony here is that um, if we only said that the people who had the right to punish people were those who've been, who themselves have been punished for their crime, we'd have nobody in this room having the right to punish anybody. It'd be only the people we punished who could carry out punishments because we've all, I mean, I know I have, been not been found, uh, not been caught for my uh, crimes, so I've therefore paid no penalty for them. And for me to somehow say people should be punished for their crimes is, is, is enormous hypocrisy. And I think it's generally true for the, for the general public. So uh, I, uh, on, the, on the one hand, I very much appreciate a focus on uh, youth as an investment area in, in the same way that we have thought about um, elderly. But I also think this, um, and I don't think you were saying this, Maggie, but, uh, uh, but I, th I think we have to carry in our minds the fact that this dichotomy between the bad guys who commit crimes and the good guys, us, who don't, is a false one, and that we've enabled it, that dichotomy to, uh, to justify producing a world in which, um, in which we reproduce that belief uh, by the way we treat people. I, I want to pick up directly on, on what you just said, um, because uh, within the good guy and bad guy um, paradigm, um, we've got good bad guys and bad bad guys, um, <laughs> and I'm here to say that I did get uh, caught for uh, at least one of my crimes, but nothing happened to me uh, because I was a, a young white person. And I spent a couple days in jail with a number of young black women all of whom went to prison. And so I started visiting them. I got out really quickly. I started visiting them in prison and that's what got me into, um, you know, beginning to holler two years after you did that we got to do something about all these people who are in jail because they're poor and all these, uh, all this racial disparity. And hey, you know, we had fewer than 500,000 people in prison back then, I think, I, you know, right? Um, uh, so what to say more about that? I, I, in addition to the, the issue of, um, of um, uh, the, the success of driving while black, I will say, and, and Tanya's completely right, that the attenuation of stop and frisk has got to do with the, dis, dis, the perception of who's suffering as compared with um, you know, black executives in, in their uh, uh, BMWs. Um, but, again, to go back to what I said in the answer to the first question, an Atlantic Philanthropy and OSF initiative three years ago to really raise the, the resistance to stop and frisk, raise the volume, is, uh, is, is paying off. And I think um, we're about to see, I mean, the Justice Department day before yesterday, um, uh, were they asked? They just, they issued a proclamation that, uh, that New York City needs a monitor and needs to end this stuff. And um, I think I'll be shocked if the federal judge doesn't fine for the plaintiffs. So, you know, back to organizing, building mass movements on these critical issues. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Judy. I think it can be done, and the stop and frisk camp work in New York City is a really brilliant of example of how um, constituencies, a number of different constituencies, young people, organizers, um, lesbian and gay communities have come together with researchers to really show the case as to the pervasive reach of stop and frisk and how it's um, ensnaring so, so, so many people in certain neighborhoods of New York. I just think it's harder. 
it's always it's har always harder when it's a racially con concentrated um, impact on uh, particularly poor communities. It's the communications work is harder, and it's always tricky, right? P particularly when you raise these issues of race, because there's a way in which talking about race disparities can just reinforce in people's mind that yes, okay, well that is in fact the criminal element. And I think one of the um, utilities, one of the, the strategies in the stop and frisk work that's been useful is to show just how many stops and frisks there have been and what the low hit rate is. I mean, abysmally low. So it's ensnaring so many people who have no criminal involvement whatsoever. And you know, the sad fact is, even though, Todd, I agree with you that it's not about in innocence, the fact is those narratives of innocence right. help us right. in a That's communications right. campaign. Yeah. And we have right. to be open to, to using them. On, on the list of things of what I wish I'd said, in, in answer to Maggie's question, I wish I'd said that, um, that um, you know, 25 years ago, you couldn't get a conversation going about uh, the problems people face trying to make it after they're released from prison. Mm -hmm. And that's the only conversation that's going on now. So people like Jeremy Travis, I credit them for having changed the conversation framework that we find ourselves in. It's much easier now to say, uh, this person's leaving prison trying to make it, and here are all the barriers. So something has changed profoundly out there, and it is easier to do the, that kind of work, and I, that's what I wish I'd said instead of what I did say. I, I would just add, um, Going back to Todd's point about the good guys, bad guys, as someone who's been in the room where sentencing commission people are talking about things in more than one state, that conversation occurs in those rooms. It's not a matter of it's just out, you know, uh, on TV or something like that. It, it, there are states where where the idea of we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, at least among some of the policymakers at the table has actually driven what those states had either ended up doing or not doing. And it's not just one or two states. There are several that you could, you could name in this. And, and that, back in another lifetime when I actually taught at, in a university, I, uh, my favorite book for those of you, I don't even know if they, because uh, it was written back in the 70s where they used paper. <laughs> um, it was a book called, uh, by William Kerr Muir uh, called uh, Police Street Corner Politicians. And if you ever, if you can find that anywhere, uh, he set up a dichotomy of cops, but it would apply to people in policy making too. And, and the ideal, he said, was the person who is able to, the, the police, uh, police officer who is able to do his job but put his himself in the place of the people he was doing it to. And, and respond appropriately to that. Uh, there are other categories in that, but that's essentially where you have the other people driving your policy, you get these kinds of policies. What we have to get to is to find and to encourage and to support the guys in your policy making community, as Todd was talking about, but also in your media, in your community groups that Judy works so much with, and, and make sure they're empowered, uh, the ones that have that there but for the grace of God perspective as well. I gotta say one more thing about this good guy, bad guy paradigm, which is that it, it, it is ground into the uh, mechanics of criminal justice on the street you know, and at arraignment with police and prosecutors, they know, they know, they, they're absolutely sure they know who is a good guy, who is a bad guy. A prosecutor uh, once told me years ago um, that, you know, dealing with people coming into uh, the system for arrest, we know who are the good guys and who are the bad guys, and our job is just to, you know, lock up the bad guys and let the good guys go, right? Well, you know, the fruit of that mentality in police and prosecution is the ethic that is responsible for the fact that it's been estimated maybe 25%, up to 25% of the people who are serving prison terms are not guilty of the crime they pled guilty to because it justifies the mentality is we can do anything to put the bad guys away, including manufacturing evidence and you know spinning the story so that um, um, you know, they, they're, they're terrified to go to, to go to trial, right? Stack up the numbers and threaten them with a big stick. But you uh, can see that in the uh, Central Park Five. The, uh, oh, please, uh, if you haven't seen you the haven't movie, seen if you it. haven't read the book. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Other questions right here?
um, I've done some work on prison labor issues going back to the, um, the mid-70s. Um, I wanted to study of prison programs for the California legislature. Um, and I think although the prison labor issue um, isn't unimportant, it's, it, it's not a, a, a driver. P uh, particularly people think that we're locking people up sort of in order to um, use them as exploited labor for, for Victoria's Secret or whatever. I mean, there's just very, very, that's, it's overamped. It's very, very little of that. The private prison situation is entirely different because you're talking about publicly traded companies that have to increase their market share in order to support their, um, their stock value. Um, and uh, and, that, and that's, that's the bottom line. Um, and so they push, 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 although they claim they don't lobby, they, they lobby plenty, and that's why they call it the lobby, because you can't see them doing it. Um, they lobby through ALEC, they lobby uh, through, they lobby through the relationships, the revolving door, the number of people from federal and state pr uh, correctional systems that, that go to work for the, the, you know, GEO and CCA and so forth. And although, you know, it's kind of like the, you know, the defense industry, private prisons didn't invent the problem of mass incarceration, but once they got in there, um, they're skewing the policy debates uh, in ways that, are, you know, it takes on a life of its own. It's really a problem, particularly in states like Oklahoma that have become heavily dependent on, on the pr private prison industry. Yeah, I would, it, it may be 8% nationally, but it's, and you look at your New Mexico's and Oklahoma's and stuff, you're talking 20, 25, 35, 40%. Um, and what happens is, is that they establish a, um, a kind of a threshold that once you hit it, as a state, you're unable to back off of it because you no longer have the facilities. You've locked yourself into contracts with, uh, with particular occupancy rates guaranteed at particular rates. You lose control of your state budgets uh, doing that. And you also, uh, Judy was, was very nice, uh, not to mention <laughs> the, uh, the corruption that's usually involved in this. It's, uh, I, would, I would just ask you to keep an eye on Oklahoma over about the next three months. Uh, I'm just throwing that out there. Um, and uh, the, the thing about the, um, the, the, pro the, poli uh, the um, prison work is just simply, um, in Oklahoma, they didn't make license plates anymore. I mean, the, the major work that they would do would be on farms, which might actually be helpful, but it can also be seen as, you know, the bad old days again. But uh, they were in state industries. You know, they would make the desks and the, um, the chairs and all that sort of stuff for state um, uh, offices, which drew a lot of heat because there are also furniture makers who would like to be selling the state, that sort of stuff, too. That's where your major issue comes in. In terms of recidivism, they're actually pretty effective. But it's, it's kind of a, are they effective, changing people who would have been different, or are they effective because guys who have already decided they can change, have been just selected to work in them, you know, I mean, it's yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. So. Just a, wanna, quick, just a quick point. If you can reduce the cost of incarceration from $40,000 a year to 38500 that's a marginal change. But if you do it at the, at the expense of increasing the number of people incarcerated by 20%, it's a stupid idea. And anybody who thinks you can privatize your way out of the cost of incarceration doesn't understand capitalism. Yeah. In, in the back, this... Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Sheila Blue. I'm a graduate of John Jay. I worked in social services, and I'm a resident of Harlem. I say all of that because Harlem has been gentrified. It's not new. And I'm seeing this policing. I'm seeing policing of small, you talk about adolescents, teenagers. I'm seeing policing of tiny little kids that's just coming out of school, and there's like five police officers on the corner, black, white, mixture, yelling at them to move along, move along. And I'm like, these are kids. They're like nine, they're like eight. I'm seeing policing like seven officers, gangs of officers to the extent that I'm afraid of the police. Because there's gangs of police officers walking through Harlem, making people move, people that live in their neighborhoods, not just the corners, but in the street, just coming out of their buildings, hanging out, move along, move along. And I'm like, are you serious? I'm seeing intense policing. I study policing while at John Jay. You know, you read a textbook, but when you see it, you talk about public opinion. People have various ideas about the criminal justice system. You talk about policies and how do you change that. Yes, it is definitely the media. I grew up on Sarah Jessica Parker in the after school special. 
it changes you. It makes you think a certain kind of way. Yes, you're absolutely right, Dr. Clark. I think I came in late. I missed your, uh, your lecture. But um, the po uh, clear. I mean, I meant to say Dr. Clear. The policy, a lot of times, you think based on what the policy says. I remember when Giuliani was the mayor. He criminalized the squeegee board guys, the guys that come around and clean the windows. Literally, within two weeks, a guy was cleaning someone's window by Yankee Stadium, off police officer, off duty police officer, got out of his car and shot this guy. Because two weeks prior, Giuliani criminalized a simple act like cleaning the window. So I don't even, honestly, I, I think it's the media, I think it's the policies, and we have to change public opinion because if we don't, we walk around so ignorant. My neighbor thinks it's okay that police can make young people move off the corner. I'm like, you don't seem to understand. This is policing. These, are, you don't, these police officers don't necessarily know if these guys are innocent or guilty. You talk about innocent or guilty. It, the, the policing in this, in this country is disgusting. And if you don't change public opinion, I mean, honestly, I just feel like I'm living in a police state. I really do feel like I'm living in a police state. I don't know what to do. I came here today because I was, you know, on John Jay's website, and I thought, I have to come here because I don't know who else to talk to. I need to talk to some people like like minds because when I talk to my neighbors, they just don't get it. Oh, those black people, they're, and they're black too. They're black too. But, like you said, you know, oh, these guys are hanging out in the corner. Sheila, it's good. It's good. It's good that the police are moving them. And I'm like, I want to I wanna acknowledge. If these are white guys on the corner, would the police do that? I want to acknowledge your frustration. So that's I what I'm here today, because I need to, oh, this man. Is what I need to do. Yeah. I don't know what to do. And I'm afraid that the police are going to stop me and handcuff me simply because I'm walking down the street in Harlem. But I want to also tell you, there are a lot, if you live in Harlem, because I know Harlem, there are a lot of folk who are on the ground working. I spent the day yesterday, the Interfaith Center of New York had a retreat with religious leaders from around the city, many from Harlem, uh, talking about police community relations. And the passion there was incredible. On the, in the community, what we see, forget you know, what you hear or what you see on TV, what we see is often something that really, uh, how can I put it, you, know, you see things, you see behaviors by the police, by the system that don't, that don't make sense to you. You don't see it in other parts of the city. And it's very frustrating. And I think lots of time the kind of over-involvement of the formal system shrinks away you know, I'm wondering, maybe the parents would be there doing that, <laughs> or teachers, or community volunteers. But, you know, there are, and I'll, let's talk afterwards, because there are folks who are very interested in, you know, in, in, in that issue, and there's a lot of uh, work going on around that. Um, and, you know, I would just say that um, it, it, your sister, your passion and your anger is, you Right, and you're, you're, I mean, you're not alone, and I yeah. think this is why Michelle Alexander's book has really struck such a chord with people, and, you know, she has really emphasized the need for grassroots movement building. Like, we yeah. need a movement that says enough, and that is really led by communities of color, and I do think that we're beginning to see more grassroots organizing and groups in different communities that are really trying to address address the problem from that perspective. And I think we are coming to a tipping point. I mean, there's still plenty of, you know, conservative folk, um, conservative voices within communities of color saying, no, this is what I need to feel safe. But I think, you know, and Todd, I mean, you were doing this work, you know, 15 years ago about the ecology of crime and how the, the criminal justice system was undermining the very social fabric of communities. But now I think people in those communities are feeling it. They feel, they see the ways in which criminalization is undermining both familial ties as well as um, economic prospects of their community. And that is and has to be, I think, the basis for the kind of social movement that we're seeing. Unfortunately, I think it's taken you know, its toll on thousands and millions of lives ruined um, for us to get to this point. But I really feel like we're at a tipping point where we, we can build that And there are a lot of great activists. You know, I want to, I'm kind of being positive about this, a lot of folks who have been consumers of this system are standing up, and that to me is very mm -hmm. inspiring. I see that in my work. You know, we hired uh, some folks who are formerly incarcerated to work in a courthouse, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, with people coming out of prison, and it is very powerful, you know, to watch that happen, that process uh, happen. So I want to take two more questions. I know time is running out, this gentleman here. 
My name is Peterson Lambert. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I am totally you know, um, intrigued by the presentations. The only thing, one thing I didn't um, agree with is that the good guy, guy, bad guy. Those people who are incarcerated are not bad. I always say that from my experience. They only do bad things, but they're not bad. And if you get to know them, they can change, even in the society, if we, we really show them the kind of love and understanding that they, they deserve, they will not do the bad things. What I'm looking at, though, is the, this forum, where do we go from here? This is my question. Okay. I mean, it's all right to have an academic discussion. <clears throat> what are we going to do with the pre-K? What are we going to do? Get, stepping out of the silo, I agree with all. But the political will, convincing the politicians, the lawmakers, is my concern as to what we should do. Because, as Mr. Clare just said, policies and public opinion will follow policies. So I just want to know what are we going to do? What, do is, this, what is the strategy? So maybe have the panelists highlight you know, one or two. I know we've covered a couple of things. Organize and litigate. <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, I mean, that's, that's um, a, a major part of it. I also would argue that, as I said before, that I don't think, um, with due respect, I don't think the foundations on this side of it have done the same work that the foundations on the right have done in terms of creating messengers and forums and publications and this constant, constant, constant uh, repetition of their messages. Uh, it, they may not resonate at first, but if it's clear they're not going away and events in the world around you tend to reinforce them and you can show that as they happen, then uh, you're, you're empowering the groups that Judy works with to, um, to be able to tell those legislators we can supply votes against you if you don't pay attention to us, and that's where it's going to have to come from. Great. Uh, one more, last question. Yes. Uh, hi, so I'm Jasmine Karakai, and I'm an intern with the Prisoner Reentry Institute. Um, I kind of want to go back to this idea that you know if we can kind of change these, that if we can change policies, we can possibly end mass incarceration. But then taking a step back and looking at kind of the wider um, implications of racial justice. Um, so my question is, if we were able to um, make these changes on a policy level and reduce rates of incarceration and kind of exit this era of mass incarceration, do you think that the racial disparities in rates of arrest and incarceration would actually change? Oh, can I take that question? <laughs> <laughs> this is, I feel like this has been my abiding work for 25 years and we still haven't gotten it right. You know, Todd talks about the iron law of prison populations. I sometimes like to talk about the iron law of racially diminished returns of diversion and alternatives to incarceration. I mean, the truth is that whatever, almost whatever ATI, you know, alternative to incarceration and diversion program, whether it's on the adult level or the juvenile level, the people who tend to most benefit are the white folks, right? And the people who tend to least benefit are, are often the, the people of color because there is a degree of discretion in who gets the benefit of those of those um, diversionary measures. I think it's particularly pronounced in um, the juvenile justice system for a number of complicated reasons. But I think you have to assume that's going to be the case and counter program against it. Truly counter program against it. Where are places that you can constrain discretion, that you can have a rubric that every supervisor who's signing off on this has to show that they have thought about this or thought about that or thought about, okay, is the fact that this kid in front of me, this black kid in front of me is in foster care, right, and has no parent to come pick him up at the station house, is that impacting my thinking about whether he should be diverted and get, you know, I'll send him home and tell him to come back from court, or am I thinking, oh, he doesn't have a parent, I'm going to hold this kid in detention. I mean, you have to, I think, have that level of consciousness to counteract what is, unfortunately, the natural tendency in a country with our kind of ugly racial history to um, give the benefit of the doubt to the white folks and not to the um, 
to the people of color in the system? I would go back to one of the things I pointed out on that, just simply that the more you can take offenses out of play, uh, not just pot, but the, uh, the other sorts of things that come into play, and, and not turn them into misdemeanors, uh, I mean, get rid of them. Um, and, and the more that you can find these alternative, and you basically say, and, and you get into Tanya's problem here, that how do you deal with the disparity in civil or mediation or all those sorts of things. But if you just shrink things, uh, shrink the pool, um, just by the numbers of that, you're going to move some of the people out of the system, and not all of them would be wide. Um, that's not a very hopeful thing, I realize. But I mean, uh, by, by thinking about the ways we restructure what we do so that it's not all criminal processing. I, I call it the criminal processing system. I don't call it criminal justice. Uh, it, 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 if we cut our criminal processing, that would go away, I think, uh, towards your talking Do the, about. Does the move towards risk assessments help on, the, on this question? Oh. Um, <laughs> Without opening up a... <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the literature on, on you know, are, do you need a, a race-based uh, assessment and so forth? I, I'm not, I've never been real impressed with any results from all that. Um, the, one of the things that risk assessments do is they take into account the prior criminal behavior and associations and are those people, you know, you get the motivation, like, do, do your friends commit crimes? And yeah, um, and so you, you get some of this, the scoring on those things mm -hmm. can be, um, can be a, a reflection of the environment you're living in as much as actual behavior. And so I, I'd say, bleh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there's considerable uh, uh, you know, literature that um, appears to support the idea that interventions or diversion should be g given to high-risk people. Right. And so I think the folks in Missouri are moving in the right direction where it's not just a matter of risk score, but there's, it's also hard data that imprisonment is going to make this person worse, that recidivism, you know, that let's, let's do something else. Yeah, yeah, I, I would like to say, as a person who's been working in the risk area for a long time, risk uh, assessment-based strat strategies can make things better, but they won't necessarily make things better. Uh, and uh, I think in any logic... Um, of a system that will um, uh, uh, work better, uh, the idea of risk has to be accounted for somehow. So, you, so, and risk assessment might be a way of doing it, but um, uh, but it's not a it's not a bullet, magic bullet. Uh, one la yeah, one <laughs> last thing I would say about it is risk assessment. Where I think it contributes to the conversation is really in there the way of getting us away from violent, nonviolent and um, prior criminal history as the category and that sort of stuff because those things are so politicized and, and the definitions, uh, you end up, it, it's just a, a dog's plate of, of conversation. Whereas if you, if you at least have something that has been validated and has some scientific uh, authority behind it, you can talk more effectively about people that you're dealing with than you can if you're talking about violent, nonviolent, and, and uh, three-time burglary. Too. One little illustration that goes to much of um, what Tanya was saying about racial fears, um, there was a pretrial risk score that was uh, compiled by, I think, the Administrative Office of the Courts in Minnesota uh, to predict like risk and uh, flight, as those things do. Um, and it got uh, validated, uh, uh, maybe 10 years later, it took them a long time. When they went through the validation, they were able to show that race was not a predictor, um, and that there were other factors that were the salient factors for, redisc you know, for, for predicting accurately pretrial um, misbehavior. Turned out, I called up the, the woman who had uh, done the validation to find out more. Um, it turned out, she said, well, when we did the original model, when we, when, when we put together the, the risk uh, scoring system, um, race didn't come up then either, but we, were, we had a panel of judges, and they insisted that race be in the risk system. And so now we're able to take it out again. Well, I want to join everyone else, hopefully, in thanking our panel.
wonderful presentation. I'd like to, I've been asked to announce also that later today you'll receive a survey about this event by email, and if you could just take a few moments to fill it out, it would really uh, be very helpful. Uh, thank you all, and hopefully the work continues. Take care.